All right, welcome to the video lecture on uh, the combined chapter 12, 13, and 14. I'm taking all of these, uh, these three chapters and I'm just grouping them all together. In the last video lecture, uh, we looked at um, <clears throat> all the planets in the solar system, and now we're interested in uh, the leftover stuff. So it basically, if you're not the sun or any of the planets or any of the moons of the planets who fall in this other category, which actually has a lot of objects in it that we just kind of generally refer to as space debris. And um, for what we're going to be talking about today, you can really break up space debris into three categories. And those three categories are asteroids, uh, meteoroids, and comets. So we're going to go through those. And uh, near the end, we'll talk a bit about uh, Pluto and some of the uh, other larger objects that are sitting in the outskirts of our solar system. So let's go uh, talk about asteroids first. So I have uh, several pictures here that show off different asteroids. And, you know, when you look at these pictures, you know, the thing that you want to think about here is, you know, what do these look like? I mean, it's really good to compare the pictures to other things that are in the solar system uh, because it helps you understand, you know, how they formed and what has happened to them over time. So when you look at these, I mean, uh, what, the, you know, the image that conjures, uh, that this conjures in your mind is, is this looks a lot like the, our moon, right? So why is that? Well, there's no atmosphere on the moon, basically, and asteroids are pretty small things and they can't maintain atmosphere. And so that really dictates how they're going to look. You know, when you look at the Earth or you say, look, even at Venus or, or places that have somewhat of an atmosphere, you see that the, the appearance of the object to a large extent is dictated by its atmosphere. So you have things like erosion from like water and wind. Um, but on these objects, you don't have erosion or anything like that. So what shapes the objects over time are simply uh, collisions with other things. And so you can see uh, from these objects, there are you know, smaller craters, and there are some big things. If you look near the top here, it looks like there's an enormous chunk taken out of this object here. And what that suggests is that, you know, these objects, uh, you know, have been around a while probably and have experienced a lot of collisions. And very likely, um, these things were larger in the past. And uh, because of all these collisions, they've broken up and become smaller things. Uh, but uh, the sort of uh, somewhat official definition of what you would call an asteroid is you, we, it's an object that's in space larger than a meter and, um, you know, and does not have a significant amount of ice content on it. Um, that would put it more into the comet uh, classification of things. But um, the thing about asteroids that are important is if you're over a meter in size, then either you are... You know, and if, actually, if you could be, you know, much larger than a meter in size, I mean, maybe like a kilometer or 10 kilometers, then you're most likely are, you know, a rock that formed in the early solar system, and you've kind of just persisted this entire time. So you actually may be a pristine rock from the early, early, early uh, creation of the solar system. Um, it's possible. You also could just be broken up from things, but there's a good likelihood. If you're under a meter, there's, there's really no way that you have survived being under a meter for billions of years in the solar system. So those are almost always going to be things that were part of, uh, you know, collisions and things like that. Anyway, uh, so asteroids are, are, they are sort of randomly all over the solar system, but there are um, places where they sort of show up uh, the most. And so this picture here, this is actually a map that NASA generated. Um, I'm not sure, it's actually on a particular day where, you know, they keep track of all of the uh, inner solar system bodies and uh, this is a map that sort of shows the location of all those. And the white portion that you see here <clears throat> is what's known as the asteroid belt. It's a region that goes from about 2 to about 3.5 AU, where you find most of the asteroids in the inner solar system. But it's definitely not the only place that you find asteroids. Um, if you even look in the inner solar system, there's all sort of objects there. In fact, um, you know, at the time of this recording, this is, uh, you know, early 2020, um, there was a story that came out about a couple weeks ago about an asteroid that is like a temporary moon for the Earth. I mean, sometimes these are referred to as corkscrew asteroids. They just, Earth captures an asteroid, keeps it for weeks or a few months, then it flies away. And so, you know, there's a lot of wandering things that get caught here. Anyway, when you look at this picture, it looks like 
uh, it's really crowded, right? It looks really, really crowded here. Um, and so um, it's a little deceiving to see the crowdedness here because it does make it, you know, seem like there's, there's quite a bit of rocks here. But, um, you know, based on studies we've done of the asteroid belt, if you actually take all the rocks in the asteroid belt and combine them into a single object, it, it wouldn't even be the size of the moon. So it's actually not a lot of material overall. There's actually enormous spaces between the asteroids compared to their size. So this picture's a little deceiving. If you had this, uh, you know, more accurate, the dots would be tiny, like extremely tiny to the point you maybe you really can't see them. I uh, also know in this picture that there are some other areas where we find asteroids. Uh, <clears throat> there is a group that exists in the orbit of Jupiter called the Greeks and the Trojans. They sort of lead and trail uh, Jupiter, they kind of move with Jupiter as they go around the solar system. So, you know, this is an interesting pattern, and it does make you think, you know, what's going on here? This doesn't really seem to be a coincidence that the asteroids organize themselves in this way. And so there's kind of a, a bit of a history to this. If you go back um, far enough, we're talking about maybe very early part of the 19th century, or maybe the late part of the uh, of the 18th century. Um there, you know, we knew planets out to, you know, Uranus at that point had been discovered. Um, and it was strongly believed that there was a planet that existed between Mars and Jupiter. And the reasons for it is kind of strange, actually. You could look this up. It's called the Titus Bode Law. And it's this strange mathematical sequence. Um, I forgot exactly how it goes. I think it's you take multiples of three, add one and divide by ten, something like that. But anyway, uh, this strange sequence of numbers seems to predict very well the position of all the planets. I mean, if you you know you go Mercury and you know first number is Mercury, then it's Venus, and then it's Earth and Mars, and then there's this other number that's between the number for Mars and Jupiter, and then the sequence continues. So, a lot of astronomers at the time thought that this is more than a coincidence or maybe something to the sequence here, and so astronomers you know for a long time looked um, to find. Uh, a missing planet, basically. And they looked and looked, and around the very early part of the 19th century, it might have, very early, actually, like 1801 or 1802 or so, uh, they discovered the object that's on the left here. Uh, that object is called Cirrus. It is the largest asteroid in the asteroid belt. And so they found this object. There was a lot of excitement because they thought, oh, well, you know, this is the other planet because it kind of looks like a planet, even though it looks more, a bit like our moon. And so actually it was called a planet for almost a decade or so, and then it got demoted when we sort of learned more about this object. As more and more people observed it, we realized it actually wasn't very large. Um, and we discovered a lot of other things in its area. So like the one on the right here called Vesta is, you know, up in the top five of all asteroids. And so, you know, there's a lot of these things that are discovered. So it was realized that like, okay, well, maybe, you know, this is not a planet, but then all these pieces are here, and so the next, you know, logical step you take is that, well, maybe there was a planet here, and it got destroyed. And these are all the bits and pieces that are, uh, that are left over. Well, that doesn't work either, because again, now we know that if you add up all the mass of the asteroids, it's not a very big object anyway. Also, there's a lot of variety in the asteroids that we see there. It doesn't look like it was a single object that got broken apart. Anyway, so after all this, um, we sort of have a better understanding of what's, what's going on here. And, and what's going on here is something called Lagrangian points. Okay, so Lagrangian points, this is a, a topic in astrophysics. Uh, these basically mean points of gravitational stability. And so what happens is the Sun and the Jupiter are controlling this environment. And there's areas around Jupiter where it controls things. And so where you see the Trojans, where you see the Greeks, um, in between the Sun and Jupiter, on the other side of the Sun, and then on the other side of Jupiter, way maybe down on the left here, these are different Lagrangian points, and so they're gravitational stability points. So what happens is an asteroid will wander into this region, and then it gets stuck, basically. So you can kind of think of the asteroid belt as being this like gutter of the solar system where things come by and they get stuck here, and then they just end up here, and it just... So what we're looking at is really you know, billions of years of asteroids wandering into this area and building up over time, and, and that's what we see here. So that's our understanding of the asteroid belt. Uh, these two pictures here, by the way, are taken from the Dawn spacecraft. This was a, a spacecraft that had visited some of the large asteroids to uh, sort of learn more about them. The one on the left is really interesting because it's the largest one. It's round. 
uh, we know that it actually has a, a bit of water. In, in fact, this crater that you see in the middle here that has this white stuff here, we believe it was an impact that broke through the rock and then there was liquid water underneath that welled up and froze. And Cirrus has been kind of interesting to us because, you know, you know, down somewhere in the future here, we hope to leave our solar system. And uh, this particular asteroid here would be actually be a great place to be like a launching pad to get out of the solar system because, um, you know, most of the work to leave the solar system is in the inner part of the solar system. You're basically trying to overcome the gravitational influence of the sun. And so if you're not, if instead of starting at Earth, you're just starting out at an object that's out at, you know, tw you know two or three times that distance, um, you've actually accomplished quite a bit of the uh, work that's required. So uh, we'd first send people to Sirius and then a larger ship would take them. Uh, away. So that's that's something, you know, it's been talked about way in the future, probably not in our lifetimes, but it's something that we're interested in, in doing. Um, I have a video um, uh, that if you go to my um, homepage, okay, so if you go to my homepage and click on the astronomy link, if you go down, I have a bunch of videos for this lecture. And I have a video here of the Cirrus uh, flyover. So this is when the Dawn mission came by and flew over that and took a lot of pictures. And so that's a NASA video where they sort of explore around. So I recommend that you check that out. It's pretty neat. All right, let's keep going here. All right, now, so that's asteroids. The next group are meteoroids. So meteoroids are different than asteroids in uh, by basically size and mass. Uh, meteoroids are small rocks in space, um, meter or less typically. And again, the reason for the meter is that meteoroids are most definitely, um, or parts of larger things that have broken apart. And so studying meteoroids is helpful to understand what were those things that broke apart and, and, and how do those compare to the asteroids that we see here. Now there's a lot of terminology involved in this stuff that we have to make sure we, uh, we understand. So um, there's basically three terms you see here that you, you want to you get. So meteoroids, that word sounds like asteroids. So you want to think about, okay, it's a rock in space. Uh, we have meteors. Uh, meteor is a um, is when one of these rocks, now it could be a meteoroid or it could be an asteroid, but, just, but one of these rocks from space enters our atmosphere and then it begins its descent to the ground. And, and we call that a meteor, which is synonymous with the term shooting star. When we say shooting star, obviously that's, that's not a star at all. That's just a rock that has entered our atmosphere. And then due to the high amount of friction with the air, it's, it heats up. And so it produces a lot of thermal radiation. And so that's the streak that you see as it flies by. And most of these things are really small. You know, if you go outside on any given night and look up at the sky, you'll see these streaks. I mean, you know, if you stare up for a good half an hour, you well, I'm going to see, you know, one or two or so. And most of them are just a little white streak. You see it for a second, boom, it's gone. And when you see it gone, that, um, most likely that rock completely vaporized. It, it heated up to the point where it just vaporized in the atmosphere. Sometimes, however, the rocks are bigger and they have a bigger impact. Now, if one of these rocks actually makes it to the ground, so it may heat up, it may melt, partially vaporize, but if it actually ends up hitting the ground and it becomes a rock on the Earth's surface, we call that a meteorite. And, um, and meteorites are, uh, again, nice to study because we don't have to be in space to get these rocks. And, um, and, and we can show you an example of this. Uh, there was a very famous uh, meteor that passed all right, so uh, what they're going to share here is just this is a compilation of various uh, 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 um, uh, video that was taken in Russia of this event. And so you can see this big streak moving across the sky. It's very, very bright. And then it kind of has this huge explosion right there, right? And uh, that huge explosion is a, it's basically a giant shock wave, and that, that giant shock wave uh, can affect, you know, all over the area, so it blows out windows. I mean, we live in the AV, and you're familiar with sonic booms and things like that. It's a sonic boom that's basically so intense that it actually can break windows and things like that. Uh, if you really look closely at what's going on here, uh, we see that big flash right about here. And then right after the flash, it kind of just peters out. If you notice, it just kind of goes away and it looks like it's fragmented. And then it's kind of it's gone here. And I don't remember the aftermath of this, but it, it sort of seems like uh, 
uh, this did not hit the ground. So let me explain a bit about what's going on. So when this big flash is happening right about here, uh, you know, the, 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 the asteroid, this probably was an asteroid to begin with, it had to be very large to make something like this, but it starts to melt. And inside the rock are probably ices, maybe gases. And so as it starts to melt, these things are released, but they're super hot, so they kind of come out as a big explosion. And uh, when enough of it starts to break apart, it's kind of like, uh, you know, it's like breaking a sugar cube in, in, you know, in tea or in water, where, you know, if you just increase the surface area of it, all of a sudden it's going to vaporize a lot faster now. And so that's probably what's happened here, is it got to a point where it was able to actually fragment into pieces, and then those pieces just go up much faster than it would before, and then it doesn't actually make it to the ground. Um, there's also a, a kind of a famous example called the Tuscaniga effect, uh, which was an, an asteroid that was um, uh, in Siberia. Uh, no, actually, they believe it was a comet that uh, passed over Siberia around 1910s or so, and it just sort of flattened all the trees for like a, a few kilometers, and all the wildlife died, and it was likely a comet that entered, and then it did this, where it just... It started to vaporize, and then when it got to a point where it could fragment, it just kind of blew up, and then it just took everything out around it. So, um, anyway, all right, let's get back to this. The only thing that's shocking about those videos is everybody's just so chill in this video. Like, they're just driving like it's nothing. So, I don't know. If I saw that, I'd at least pull over or something. All right. <clears throat> Uh, so there's a lot of energy that these things have, enormous amounts of energy. Uh, I mean, if the Earth is stationary, for example, let's just say the Earth's stationary and, uh, well, no, no, I'm sorry. If the, say the, the rock in space is stationary. and We're moving in our orbit about 30 kilometers per second. So that's very fast. We're talking like 14, 15 miles a second or something like that. And, um, and so, you know, if a rock that could potentially be the size of several meters or even up to a kilometer enters, that's an enormous amount of kinetic energy. A lot of mass, a lot of speed, and so when it comes in, that friction's really big, and then when it hits the ground, it creates these enormous craters. So we see a lot of craters like that uh, throughout uh, the Earth, and you know, over time, they get covered up. That's why when you look at the moon, you see all the crater on the moon. There's nothing to cover those things up. When you look at the moon's surface, you're basically looking at you know billions of years of crater impacts, and they just stayed that way. And on Earth something happens and it will be covered up for the most part in maybe 10,000 years or so. So that's, that's pretty different. All right. So <clears throat> now learning about these things is very interesting when you actually get down to the meteors, uh, sorry, the, the meteorites that hit the ground here. So there's some pictures of some of these things. Uh, there's basically three categories for these things. The one on the upper left here is what's called the iron meteorite. And um, as you can see, it's very shiny. Uh, it's mostly made up of very heavy elements like iron and nickel, and these are extremely heavy. If you had something that was, say, a basketball size, it would, it would be enormously heavy, 300 pounds or so. And um, and uh, so, anyway, well, let me get back to the other ones here. So uh, these are pretty rare, though. The iron meteorites are, are, are quite rare. You don't see these things often. If you were to notice one on the ground, you would... You would, you would look odd to you. It doesn't look like the rocks you find on the surface of the Earth. Now, the other one over here is a stony meteorite. And a stony meteorite is, um, it does resemble to, uh, does resemble the Earth's surface to a large extent. And uh, so seeing those rocks, you know, outside, it's very difficult to know just by a glance if, if that is a meteorite or not. Um, now, something in the middle are the, the, the things that we see down here and over on the right. These are what's called... Uh, stony iron meteorites and what those are it's a mixture of the metals and the rock the lighter things and what happens is when those things mix together you end up creating some really interesting you know glass-like structures little crystals and things like that and they're very colorful and uh, actually pretty fascinating um, the stony meteorites very difficult to identify um, so if you look at the pattern that you see down here, a lot of meteorites, when you cut them open, have these shapes to them, these patterns. And these are patterns that form in basically zero gravity environments. And so cutting up these rocks and looking inside and seeing how the structure of the rock is uh, can tell you to a pretty good extent if, if this is something that was formed in a gravitational environment or, or, or not. And, um, you know, I always get you know, at least twice a year or so, I get somebody calling me in my office and saying, you know, I found this rock, you know, can you, you know, can you uh, take a look at it for me and tell me what it is? And I generally say no, because I don't think anybody's ever sent me a rock that was actually a meteorite. 
But even if they did, I, I would have to say, well, I got to cut it open and nobody wants me to cut their rocks open. And they usually want to figure out how much it's worth so they can sell it. So I don't know. But um, if you find something like this shiny rock over here, then congratulations. Other than that, if you find this one on the right here, then you can cut it up and sell it on like Etsy for jewelry. I don't know. That, people, a lot of people do that, actually. Uh, but there's, these things really are not worth anything. I mean... No, there's no market for this stuff. They don't really have a price. It's just whoever wants to buy it and whether they're ever willing to, uh, you know, give you for it. But now, so this iron one though, um, it's kind of interesting. To me. Why is it like this? Because this is not rocks we typically see. I mean, you could see that it looks sort of like molten. I mean, it looks like it's melted, um, actually. So we actually have a good theory for what's going on with the with the variety here. And so here's our, our idea of what's going on with these meteorites. Um, you know, all these things started off at some point as a planetesimal, basically an asteroid. And what happens with all objects in the early solar system is they were initially very hot. Uh, and so they differentiated by mass. And what that means is all the heavy stuff sinks to the center and the lighter stuff stays further out. That's why the Earth, for example, has the structure of core and mantle and crust because of the differentiation that took place. And, you know, moons would do this and even asteroids will do this. So if you look in the upper right here, we have our asteroid, and it's already differentiated, and we got the heavy stuff down the bottom, we got the lighter stuff further out, and so what happens is over time, it starts getting hit by things, and pieces start to break off, and so the first pieces that break off would resemble those stony uh, meteorites, uh, because it's made up of just lighter elements, and then as you dig deeper down, um, you're starting to get things that are a mixture of the stony and the iron stuff, and then when you get down to the very bottom, you're left with that iron nickel core, and uh, it's much smaller and denser, and that's why those things are not as common. Um, but, you know, a larger thing broken up into pieces, and then we find these three different pieces, so it makes a lot of sense that they would exist like this. So that's our idea for this stuff. All right, now, another thing about meteors is that in addition to just viewing them on any given night, you can see the little streaks in the sky, and then occasionally you can see these big streaks flying across the sky like we saw in Russia. There are times where um, uh, meteors come periodically. Uh, they are actually um, linked to our calendar, which means they're linked to our orbit. There's something the Earth is doing, apparently, uh, to produce these things. And so there's a table here that shows some of the more uh, impressive meteor showers, the, the ones that are the sort of the bigger deals are the Perseids in August and the uh, Geminids in December. And, um, you know, so when you look at these things, um, you want to pay attention to this name. And you notice these names are names of constellations. And the reason why that is is because when these things enter our atmosphere, they are coming from a location in space. They, they, you're not going to see these things, you know, randomly all over the sky. If you pay attention, there actually is a particular point where they come from. We call this the radiant of the meteor shower. And that radiant is in some constellations, so it's given that. So the, for the Perseids, in August, you want to look up on a constellation chart or however you you know, you know look that stuff up, where Perseids would be. So if you know the Perseid meteor shower is going to come up, you want to look up where the Perseids is going to be, and you want to look in that area of the sky, and you'll see these streaks. okay? And they all seem to be emanating from uh, a particular location. And the way we understand this, this is very similar to the idea of vanishing points in, in, in when, you, when you're thinking about perspective in art. When you want to represent a distant object, we have a vanishing point where, you know, this, these train tracks appear to uh, recede back to a particular location. And that gives you the perspective of a great distance. And the reason why is because that's really how, you know, perspective works. And that's why these streaks look the way they do. So, um, but that's what they want to focus on. Now, for these meteor showers here, um, you know, viewing these things is, is, can be a little tricky. Um, if you know that a meteor shower is going to be taking place, you want to look up the phase of the moon. If the moon is up and, you know, fully illuminated or mostly fully illuminated, it makes the sky brighter than it would normally be, and it makes it hard to see some of the smaller meteors. So the ideal situation is, is to look at these meteors uh, when uh, the phase of the moon is, uh, is you know, crescent or even new or something like that that would be the ideal situation now if you look on the right hand side you also see associated comets okay well what's going on with that well what's happening here is um 
you know, this picture that you see here, this is a, you know, an image of what the orbit of a comet might look like if you could sort of see, you know, all the pieces of it. And there's an area where the comet exists, what's being shown here in this arrow. But, you know, what comets are doing, they're basically, when they get near the sun, they start to melt. And inside the comets are all these bits and pieces of rock, and those bits and pieces of rock get freed from the ice, and they well, can still continue to orbit, but they may start to trail in the orbit. Um, and so when you look at the orbit of a comet, you actually will see all these rocks um, in the orbit. And so whether the comet is actually still around or not, I mean, these rocks are still going to exist. And every time the Earth passes through the path of one of these things, uh, then we're going to get an influx of these meteors. So the, yeah, so the reason why we have a greater number at times is because there was apparently some comet that existed here uh, in the past, uh, and it shed a bunch of rocks, and those rocks are still around, and they get in our atmosphere. So, um, I mean, that's not really the case for every single comet, but it is probably the most common case as to how we get these meteor showers. I mean, there's other sources. I mean, asteroids can shed rocks to some extent, and so, <clears throat> all right, so let's actually get into the topic of, of comets. Uh, comets are like a very impressive aspect of astronomy. I mean, from a historical standpoint, too, it's uh, something that has been documented pretty well. Uh, in fact, uh, shortly after Kepler's laws were published, a person by the name of, by the name of Edmund Haley uh, you know, use that knowledge to basically work out how comets work. They realize that objects have to obey Kepler's laws, and that means orbits are periodic. That means things can come and go on a regular basis. And so studying, you know, all the historical records of comets, uh, he was able to put together patterns and uh, he figure out, you know, where these, how these comets are taking place. So, and not just that, too. I mean, if you go even farther back, I mean, comets are probably the most dramatic phenomenon that you can see in the sky, like a celestial event. It's In some cases, comets can be absolutely enormous in the sky. I mean, there's been, you know, records of comets that, uh, you know, take up half the sky or something, you know. So, you know, when you pay attention to the sky a lot and it becomes part of your life, you know, you use it to keep track of time and to, you know, when you're going to know when the temperature is going to change or, you know, a flood is going to occur because it, it happens on a seasonal basis. I mean, you pay attention to the sky a lot and uh, any major changes that take place, you're going to, you know, really take note of that. So, um, yeah, comets are, and even today it's like that. I mean, comets are, I mean, we haven't had a really significant comet for a while. I mean, the last comet that personally I remember was the one in 1997, hale and um, that one was, you know, I remember seeing it at night. It was up for a good week or so. Um, but even, I mentioned even today, people kind of you know lose their mind when it comes to comets. I mean, the, the one story about Hale-Bopp that's, that's really tragic was there was a, a cult called Heaven's Gate, and... Um, and, uh, you know, they thought that this comet was some kind of sign that they were going to be taken to another planet. Or, I mean, I don't really know the details here, but what ultimately resulted is this cult committed mass suicide because they thought that this was something that was going, I don't know, take them away or something like that. And, and that was really tragic. I mean, but anyway, I mean, people still act this way. I mean, when, when we first created spectrographs on telescopes and we looked at the spectrograph, uh, the, the spectrum of a comet, we noticed there was cyanide in the tail. Well, cyanide's a really simple chemical molecule. It's just three atoms, and, and uh, it's very common in space. But people heard about this, and they freaked out, and they thought that there was going to be cyanide that just was going to be laced all over the United States. And, and, uh, and so there was a bit of panic. It was like in the 1910s or so. So anyway, if a comet comes by, then don't join a cult, okay? That's the advice I have for you. All right, so what's going on with comets? Um, all right, so these are um, satellite pictures of comets. So we've had a lot of uh, situations where we've come up really close to comets to sort of see what they're like. And if you look at the nucleus of these comets, I mean, you can see that to a large extent they do resemble, you know, asteroids. And the major difference between an asteroid and a comet is simply this, that a comet contains a lot of ices on it. You know, basically things that would be gases like water and carbon dioxide and methane and things like that. Um, 
but they're frozen as ices. And, and the reason why that's happening is because these are objects that were not part of the inner solar system for most of its life. It was part of the outer solar system where it's cold. I mean, if you go out beyond the orbit of Jupiter, uh, you really can't have you know, gases on things like asteroids and, and, uh, and, 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 and most objects because uh, the, it's too cold. And so they all just freeze. And so there's a lot of rocks in the outer solar system that are basically you know, proto-cometary material. They're, that we would call them asteroids now. But if something makes them travel closer to the sun, they're going to start to sublimate. They're going to all those ices are going to turn into a gas, and then it's going to take on that familiar appearance, and then it's officially a comet. So that's what the process is called here. Um, we have a solid going directly into a gas. We call that sublimation, and that's exactly what we see here. And when that process takes place, there's a particular anatomy that that comet has. I'm going to go back to this picture. I'm going to go through the anatomy of the comet first, and then I'll come back to talk about these pictures here. Uh, but, you know, when it, a comet gets basically within the orbit of somewhere around Jupiter, Mars, I and mean, definitely by the time it gets to Mars, it's really going to have this process accelerated. And so the comet itself has a nucleus, and that's where the rock and the ice is located. And so it, that looks like an asteroid. But what happens is when those ices sublimate, they turn into like a temporary atmosphere that surrounds the comet, produces a lot of light because there's a lot of emission lines that get produced. And so we call that the coma. And that surrounds the nucleus. Uh, there are a couple tails that get generated uh, from these. Uh, one of those tails is we call the gas tail. Sometimes it's referred to as an ion tail or a plasma tail. And that's a lighter color. And uh, usually it actually has colors to it. It's not just white or something. And what that is, is that's the light gases that were once ices. And they're free. Now they're very light. So what happens is sunlight can push on them very easily and push them away. And so this gas tail here is always going to be pointed in a direction that is completely opposite of the sun. And so that, that stuff is being pushed away. The other tail is what we call the dust tail. And what that is made of, it's made up of the rocks, the bits and pieces of rock that get freed from the ices. Okay, these are the future you know, meteors in meteor showers, but they're larger you know, there can be or between dust-sized things, pebbles, large rocks or something. And you and sunlight cannot push on them as easily. And so um, what happens is they may be slowed down to some extent by uh, sunlight, but ultimately um, uh, they don't move too much. So they, they kind of stay in orbit. And what will, that will happen to them is they may start to trail the comet. So the tail that you see here is basically in the direction of the comet's path. Uh, where it came from, I should say. And so uh, that stuff is just material getting left behind. Now, it tends to be a little bit brighter because it's a lot of reflected light. Uh, it's not producing its own light. It's not really hot or anything. It's not emission lines. It's just kind of this very uh, general reflection of sunlight that occurs. All right, now this picture back here, uh, this is really interesting because there was a, 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 a mission that we sent out this was maybe five years ago or so, called Rosetta, and it had a, a lander on it called Philae. And this Rosetta spacecraft was, was meant to travel to a, a nearby comet, and so this is the comet here. And, uh, and then the lander was supposed to go and land on the surface and so study it. And so this, these pictures here are taken you know, as the spacecraft was approaching it, and you can see the comet here in comparison to L.A., so it's absolutely enormous. And this is a picture taken from the lander, I believe, or it was taken from the spacecraft just before the lander was deployed. I have a couple of videos back on that webpage there that shows uh, the descent of the comet and actually shows a video of what is basically like snowfall uh, on the comet. Uh, you know, you look at the surface here, uh, what you're looking at is, you know, basically snow. I mean, it's what you're looking at. You're looking at a rocky surface with a lot of ice all over it. And, uh, you know, to some extent, these images look like Images you'd see from the bottom of the ocean, just the way the structures look. So they're very interesting. Uh, but that's kind of the, the closest view we have of the comet. Now, this comet sits out between Mars and Jupiter, and so it doesn't have a, a significant coma to it. It just kind of rides out near the asteroid belt and um, doesn't melt much. So that's why it looks this way. All right. Now, <clears throat> so when we think about comets, um, we really start to think about what they are and what they do. Uh, you can come to some pretty interesting conclusions about them, okay? And so one of those things is this. If a comet is getting close to the sun, 
then you know these gases are coming off. Like if you look at this picture back here, that gas tail and that dust tail, <clears throat> that's material that's being left behind. That's not part of the comet anymore. So every time a comet makes a pass by the sun, it loses a little bit of its material. <clears throat> so it grows smaller in size. <clears throat> and that sort of suggests that there's a limited number of times that a comet can pass by before it's completely vaporized. And so because of that idea, we, we look for this stuff. We look, is there any way to see this stuff? And, and this is one a good example. This was a comet called Linear. Back in the year 2000, we observed this comet, and it <clears throat> passed near Jupiter. And then Jupiter's gravity sort of broke it apart into pieces and then just vaporized away. Um, there's other examples here. Uh, Shoemaker-Levy was a comet, I believe, in sometime in the 90s. Maybe it may have been 99 or 97. <clears throat> Same deal. It passed by. Jupiter, Jupiter broke it into like eight or nine pieces. Those pieces passed by the sun, and then they went back out towards Jupiter, and they just collided right into Jupiter. Uh, the pictures on the bottom show strings of craters, and these strings of craters could be pieces like Shoemaker-Levy coming in contact with a, a rocky surface, and then it kind of leaves this trail of crater in as it goes by. So these are likely, you know, comets that are that are gone now, right? So that's kind of interesting. All right, so let's continue that logic there. Okay, well, if these comets are temporary things, you know, comets, you know, the comets that we see today have not always been comets. Halley's Comet's a famous example. It came here in 1986. You know, I think it comes back in, I want to say, uh, 2052, I think is the next time it's going to come by. Uh, but after that, there's, only, there's a limited number of times it's going to come before it's gone. Okay, the implication is, they didn't always exist this way, right? So there must be a place where they come from. There must be sort of a reservoir of these icy planetesimals that exist in the solar system, and there's some sort of mechanism that feeds them in to the solar system where they make a few passes and then boom, they're gone. Well, it turns out we do know of a couple places where this happens. <clears throat> One is called the Kuiper Belt, and the other one's called the Oort Cloud. So I'll start with the Oort Cloud. The Oort Cloud is a spherical region that surrounds the solar system. And it goes out pretty far. We think it, you know, it goes out to as far as maybe 100,000 uh, AU. And so this would be, you know, just for perspective here, uh, you know, Neptune, Pluto, things like that. We're talking like 30 AU, 40 AU, so, so on. So this is really, really far out stuff. And um, this is a spherical region. And so what happens is, you know, all these icy planetesimals are out here. This is, these are pieces that were either thrown out of the solar system by, say, Jupiter or the sun, or they were just pieces that formed this way when the, when, you know, in the very early part of the solar system, more likely due to ejections. But, you know, anyway, the, they, this region exists. And so what will happen here is, you know, two rocks get close to each other, and there's a little perturbation that takes place. So what happens is, is the, the gravity of these two things just you know, change their, their orbits. And what happens is one of them might get thrown toward the direction of the sun. And if that's going to happen, then there you go. You got a, you got a new comet here. Now, it's because this region is so far away, what this produces is what we call the long period comets. Okay, so if you remember Kepler's law, if you put in 100,000 AU for Kepler's laws, you're going to get a period that's absolutely enormous on the order of, you know, millions of years. So long period comets are something that really happens just once usually. They, they, they come in really fast and they zip away super fast. In fact, again, if you go to my webpage and there's a video there uh, on a comet called ESON, which I think came by in 2013 or 14, that was a long period comet. And the long period comets can basically come from any direction because of the spherical nature of this cloud. And they have perihelions that put them super, super close to the sun. And so if you look at that video, when the, when the comet gets really close, starts to get in close to the sun, you see that it looks like it almost basically touches the sun. And in fact, for that particular comet, it got so close to the sun that the immense amount of heat from the sun just completely destroyed the comet. And so it passed around the sun, and we didn't even see it come out the other side um, because, uh, yeah, it just got destroyed completely. So that produces the long period comments. Again, usually a temporary thing. It's one pass. It goes way back out to the outer solar system where it probably is going to get lost. Another perturbation happens and it gets thrown somewhere else. On the other hand, there are what we call short period comets. And short period comets come from a region that is called the Kuiper Belt. And so this is a, a disk-shaped region. It's sort of like a second... Uh, uh, 
asteroid belt, basically, that goes from about 30 AU out to 100 AU. And it's flat. It's like, so it resembles the disk of our solar system, so it's flat. And there's a lot of icy planetesimals here, and this produces a lot of short period comets. Comets that have periods on the order of decades or maybe 100, 200 years, and they stay in the plane of the solar system. So there's a big difference between the long period and short period comets in that, in that sense. And the Kuiper Belt has actually been a region that uh, astronomers have been really interested in in the last decade or two, uh, simply because of technology. Um, we didn't really know much about that area out there. Uh, Pluto is part of the Kuiper Belt, and Pluto was discovered in 1930. And, uh, you know, at the time it was discovered, it was very special. Uh, but that started to change around the 1990s uh, when we got, you know, better technology on telescopes. Uh, that technology is basically infrared cameras, uh, CCDs that can handle infrared light. And the reason why that's significant is because, you know, if you're 100 AU from the sun, things are not bright, right? 100 AU from the sun, that's 100 times farther away than, than the Earth is. And so the amount of light that you get is 100 squared. Right, so we're talking about 10,000 times less light, which has to be reflected off the object, which is probably small, and then it has to come back to us for us to see it. And that's not a lot of light. Um, but in the infrared, it is a bit more light, and it is a bit easier to see things in the infrared because um, they do reflect uh, a bit more light. And there is a little bit of light because they're, they have a temperature to them. But anyway... My point is that the infrared is much better than the optical part of the spectrum to detect these things. And so because in the mid-90s or so we got all this infrared CCDs on cameras, there was a huge explosion of discoveries in the Kuiper Belt. And uh, <clears throat> so that's been of you know, great interest to us. Uh, in fact, when a lot of this was taking place, NASA planned a mission to go to Pluto. And not just to Pluto, to go to the, really the Kuiper Belt and explore the things that are out there. And so... Um, you know, the images you see here, these are the images <clears throat> from New Horizons. I believe this spacecraft was launched in 2005, and it got there about nine years later, so this would be 2014 or 15. And um, and so these are the pictures we got. Now, these, this is a very different thing, right? This is not like the outer planets at all. It does kind of look like the moon, but it's different in the sense that there's uh, a, a lot more interest in um, geology on the moon because of all the ice. There's all kinds of interesting structures. Uh, if you go, again, to my webpage, there's a video. It's a flyby of Pluto where they did the same thing, where they just took all the images and, and, and then they projected them onto a sphere so that you can actually get a good sense of what it was, uh, you know, what the flyby looked like. Uh, Pluto has a pretty significant moon uh, called Charon. In fact, we've discovered at least four or five other moons from Pluto. And then, you know, not just that, but we've discovered a lot of other objects there. And so there's a lot of members of the cat belt that are kind of interesting. Um, you know, one is uh, Eris here. Now, this was the one that created quite a stir. Uh, Eris um, is an object that at the time of its discovery, and I believe this was discovered around 2003, I want to say, yeah, November 2003. Uh, when it was initially discovered, um, it we believed it was larger than Pluto. And so... Uh, there's a group at Caltech working at this, uh, working at this, and uh, one of the main people involved here is is uh, a guy by the name of Mike Brown, and uh, he's kind of, he's a real funny guy actually. He's um, probably the leading expert, one of the leading experts, if not the leading expert on sort of outer solar system things right now, just in terms of discoveries and kind of being out there for outreach and the public eye, things like that. He's like I said, he's pretty funny. He has he has a Twitter account, and uh, that. And his handle is uh, Pluto Killer because he was sort of responsible of demoting Pluto because of his discovery of Eris here. He's quite proud of it. He wrote a book that said, you know, why I killed Pluto and why it had it coming or something. So it was all about that story. Anyway, um, my point is that Eris is, you know, looks like Pluto, right? And so he thought, well, you know, it makes sense that this is a planet. So he actually submitted a request for astronomers to recognize this object as a new planet. It would have been a 10th planet. Well, what happens in the meantime, uh, a lot of other objects start to become discovered. And there's some of the objects you see here. And then, you know, <clears throat> there's so many objects now similar to Pluto. It's now raising this weird question. It's like, well, okay, are we, how, are we, how many planets are we going to have here? I mean, are we going to have 15 now, 20, 30? 
um, you know, so many objects were discovered that it kind of almost seems like the term planet is just has no significance anymore. So this forced astronomers to get together in 2016 and come up with a definition, right? And this is the definition here. We surprisingly we did not have really a a, a good uh, definition of what it means to be a planet until this point here. And this isn't even even a complete definition because this really only applies to our solar system. And it only applies to objects that are rather small instead of being rather large. Um, at some point, if you're large enough, then, you know, you're a star, obviously. So there's somewhere in the middle where you have to kind of make a cutoff for that. So that's, that's not really not been decided because there's been nothing to really force the question there. But anyway, this particular definition here sort of settles the matter and it ultimately involves Pluto being demoted to, um, I mean, technically it's an asteroid. I mean, the, one of the first things that happened when it demoted Pluto was they assigned it an asteroid number. Um, but shortly afterwards, they, uh, they came up with a, a new definition called dwarf planet. All right, so let me go through the, uh, the, the rules here. Rule number one is got to orbit the sun. Okay, seems, seems, seems obvious, but um, basically that's excluding moons. So a moon can't be a planet. Okay, um, in fact, there are a couple moons that are bigger than Mercury, actually. So... Uh, you might be tempted to call them a planet if they were in a different location, but uh, they orbit um, planets, so moons don't count. Uh, they have sufficient mass to assume a hydrostatic equilibrium. What that means is that they're basically round. Okay, so like you saw Cirrus in that picture way early in the lecture here, it's round. Uh, so that means Cirrus does satisfy condition one and condition two. Um, and, you know, saying round is really a statement of, of size in a way. Uh, when you get above something like 800, 850 kilometers in diameter, uh, you'll have enough mass that gravity can be strong enough to shape you into a sphere. So this is basically a statement of, well, you got to be kind of big now. Okay. Uh, the third criteria, and this is where Cirrus fails and also Pluto fails, but it uh, has to clear its neighborhood around its orbit, which what we, I like to refer to as gravitational dominance. If you look, for example, at Cirrus, Cirrus is not in control of the asteroid belt. Uh, there's a lot of other objects that are in orbit around it. It doesn't have a major influence over that area. Uh, same thing with Pluto. Pluto is just one of many, many objects in the Kuiper belt. And in fact, Neptune actually controls the orbit of Pluto. Uh, every time Neptune goes around, I think it's three times, Pluto goes around twice. So it's called an orbital resonance. And, uh, and so, you know, Pluto's lost significance. Now, if you satisfy one and two, you are called the dwarf planet. We've created this constellation prize of a name and we call it dwarf planet. So that's part of it there. And then this diagram is interesting here. It's, it's not something I need you to know, but it's kind of an interesting way to organize all the classifications of things we have. You can see planets sit out by themselves. Uh, dwarf planet is here. And then within dwarf planets, you have things like asteroids and things that are farther out and stuff like that. So again, um, well, all I need you to know as far as classifications of the asteroids, meteoroids, and and uh, in comments, so uh, asteroids and meteoroids get broken up into a lot of smaller things that we don't really care so much about in this class. All right, so that's what it is to be a planet, right? So we end up with eight, or do we? Because we think we found another one. In fact, now that we think we found another one, I think we, we, we think we maybe have found two more. Uh, the one that's the most significant, though, is this thing we are currently calling Planet Nine. And this is also done by the person, Mike Brown, who, um, uh, with other colleagues, of course, uh, that um, thinks they discovered this object. So let me explain a bit about why we think there's a planet. Because we haven't found this. We have evidence for it. And um, we think it might take something like 20 years. So it's been about two or three years since we've looked. So it's another you know, 17 or so years until we think we'll find this thing. But let me just give you a, a bit of a story here as to, as to how this is found. Okay, so historically, we have known all the planets out to Saturn. Uranus is right at like the limit of what the eye can see. In fact, some people have seen Uranus with the naked eye, but it's so faint that it's very, very challenging to find. And we do have an associated discoverer of, uh, of Uranus. And uh, the way that Uranus was found, though, is interesting because, uh, you know, Kepler's laws get established, and then we start studying the orbits of the planets based on Kepler's laws. Now, Kepler's laws are really great. I mean, they're, they're laws. They're, they're so good that we're not going to replace them, but they're not perfect. 
And one thing that they don't take into account is interactions between planets. Okay, so when you know when Jupiter's going around the sun and we're working out its orbit and and the, the amount of time it's going to take and all that stuff, we're not considering the fact that like Saturn or Mars could be sort of tugging on it and changing its orbit slightly, which does happen because of little orbital perturbations. Well, what we do is is we, you know we look at Saturn. We say you know its orbit is not quite right, right? It doesn't follow Kepler's laws perfectly, and a lot of astronomers theorize, well, maybe there's another planet further out that's kind of throwing things off a little bit. And so they, they work out the calculations of, what you know, based on how the orbit's thrown off, where would the object have to be located to do that? And they looked and, well, you know, they found Uranus. They study Uranus's um, orbit and the same thing happened. Uh, it's a little off. And so we think there's another object out there. So, and they find Neptune, right? Neptune's a little bit off. So they look and they find Pluto. Now, Pluto doesn't, have enough mass to mess up Neptune. Pluto was a lucky shot. Uh, somebody looked in the right area at the right time. We would have found Pluto sometime in the 90s, probably. We just somebody got lucky in the 1930s and found this thing. So, um, but this whole idea of perturbations and and we we don't directly detect these objects. We just detect their influence on things. So the picture on the bottom right here is is how why we think Planet Nine exists. There's a lot of outer solar system objects that have perihelions that are all grouped together. So you notice all these perihelions down here are all clustered together. And one of the reasons that why that would occur is if there is a larger planet farther out that's sort of shepherding these things, kind of pushing them together like this. It's it's not, you know, 100% conclusive, but it's something like 95% certain that it's probably something that's causing this to take place. So again, what we do is we study the orbits of these objects very carefully. We try to figure out where this object would have to be, but it's like a needle in a haystack problem, which is extremely challenging because this thing is really far out. I mean, you know, like I said, Pluto and Neptune are around 30 to 40 AU. This thing is probably 10 times farther away. Um, and it, we think it would be somewhat like, uh, like a Neptune in a way, but a smaller Neptune. So it, anyway, it does satisfy the three criteria. It's clearly controlling its environment because it forces all these things into these orbits. And uh, there has been a little bit of evidence for maybe a tenth one, but I haven't heard a lot about that recently, so I don't know where that's going. But anyway, this is the uh, this is the story of this other one here. Okay, so that takes us to the end of this lecture here. Um,